everyone, and welcome to the first panel of today's summit, where we'll be talk focusing on the topic of understanding orbital capacity and continuing benefit from space. Uh, there it is. Please see, is this in, in the order? Yep. <clears throat> we are seeing an unprecedented level of satellite deployments and operations in low Earth orbit. Driven by the emergence of large satellite constellations, primarily for communications services. This trend calls to attention our collective understanding and approach to managing the capacity of our orbital regions and the specific shells that we might use for various constellations and applications. And how might that understanding of capacity and the tools we use to manage that capacity inform space operations, business, policy, and regulation? That is the subject of the panel <clears throat> that we will have in the next uh, hour or so. My name is Ian Christensen. I'm the Director of Private Sector Programs for the Secure World Foundation, and I have the pleasure to serve as moderator for this panel. Before getting into that discussion, however, there's one important housekeeping item that I wish to cover, questions and answers. Our panels at this summit throughout the next two days are very much discussion-based panels. So we look forward to questions to come in from both our in-person and online audience. The way that questions will be managed is through the conference app, HOVA, HOVA, however you wish to pronounce it, one or, one or the other, depending on, depending on how you feel. Um, so to access the app on your device of choice, it's available in your app store for free in your app store of choice. Log on to the Wi-Fi here at the conference or at home. Uh, the conference Wi-Fi information is up there. It is the SWF Summit Network. The password is Space Logistics. Open up the HOVA app and um, navigate into the, um, excuse me, let me find the right parts of the, of the sessions here. Um, so uh, open HOVA on your device of choice, log in with the email you registered for the conference with, and that's important if you don't use the, the email that you registered with, the app won't recognize you. Uh, register, log in with that, that email address, select the conference session for which you'd so like to submit a question and answer, or question, we'll do the answering up here, um, and then uh, go ahead through the Q&A tool there, submit the question. We will see them up here, and we will um, take those as they come in. I'd like to thank our uh, conference uh, technology speak, uh, sponsors, Space Logistics and United Launch Alliance, for their support of uh, the technology we're using today. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to get into the panel itself. The app also lists detailed bios for all of our speakers, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on speaker bios, but I just want to briefly introduce uh, our, our five speakers on this panel. Uh, Joanne Wheeler is director at Alden Legal, where she specializes in communications, satellite, and space regulatory and policy matters. She's also worked at Ofcom and the European Space Agency during her career. Uh, Anyarit Umwari is the legal and company secretary for the Rwanda Space Agency, where she leads the agency's role in the regulation of Rwandan space activities. Uh, unfortunately, Anya Reed had some visa processing delays, so uh, she has graciously agreed to join us as an online panelist today. Uh, John Janka, to my right, serves as uh, the Chief Officer for Global Government Affairs and Regulatory at Viasat, Inc. He has a deep experience as a legal expert in the telecommunications, media, and technology sector. Richard Linares is co-director of the Space Systems Laboratory at MIT, and holds a St Charles Stark Draper Assistant Professor position at MIT's Department of Astronautics or Aeronautics and Astronautics. Akhil Rao is an Assistant Professor of Economics and an affiliate faculty in the Environmental Studies Program at Middlebury College. Uh, so jump into the discussion now. And to start this panel off, I want to bring up an introductory video presentation via pre-recorded video from Professor Hugh Lewis, who is the head of the Astronautics Research Group at the University of Southampton here in the UK. He was gonna give us a little bit of context on the question of orbital carrying capacity. Uh, if we could cue the video, please. Hello everyone, I'm Hugh Lewis from the University of Southampton. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Uh, I put together a, a short talk here to talk about orbital carrying capacity that I hope will uh, illuminate some of the issues, some of the challenges around the, the problem. And I'm going to start really by asking you whether you are a glass 
half full kind of person or a glass half empty kind of person. Um, and the reason for asking you that is because um, I'm going to use this analogy through the, um, the, the slides I've got here for you. And um, what I want you to do is to, is to think about um, how this analogy, a glass half full, glass half empty, might translate into uh, our thinking about the near-Earth um, orbital environment. So if we take the approach that we're glass is half empty, then perhaps what we can do is we, we can imagine the near-Earth orbit environment as an empty box. And what we might want to be trying to do with this empty box is to fill it. And we want to understand how many items we can place inside this box safely so that it, it doesn't overflow. and We don't lose any of those, those items. Um, so if we follow this uh, approach, uh, kind of glass is half empty, therefore we can put more in and therefore we want to fill the box, then what we end up doing is thinking about this as a, as a packing type of problem. We want to find the, the most efficient way of fitting as many items as we can into the box that represents the, the low Earth orbit environment. Um, and it works really well if we understand exactly what our items look like. So here's some fruit. Um, if we uh, perhaps understand that they might all be the same, more or less the same size, the same shape and so on, we can really pack them into this box very, very e efficiently. Um, and we can um, get to the point where you know, the box is completely full with as many objects in it as we can possibly get um, and not have any problems. So we can you know, safely transport our uh, items of fruit around inside our box, you know, whatever it is we want to use this, um, uh, this for. If the items are not the same, if they differ in some way, um, perhaps they differ in terms of their mass or in terms of their size or in terms of whether or not they have propulsion, then we might want to think about a slightly different way of packing the box. We might want to arrange the box so that similar items go in similar regions of our box. You know, whatever characteristics we're using, we use those to determine where they should go. Um, and again, it's, you know, it, it's, it's an added complexity to our theme of trying to fit as many objects into this box as possible. Um, the other thing that we've really got to be careful about is, is that if we consider our items that they can be different, then of course, some of them might be breakable. Some of them might be valuable. Some of those items might be a bit shiny. So just because we can fit them all inside the box doesn't mean to say that they're all going to be safe or that um, our um, use of the box is, is suitable. So taking the example of shiny objects, um, you know, we can understand that, that satellites in the sky can reflect sunlight and then can interfere with um, astronomy, whether it being professional or amateur astronomy. Um, so we've really got to be careful about our choices that we're making here with respect to not just filling the box, but also what we're filling the box with. Another concern that we might want to um, take into account is the fact that um, any two people looking at this box might um, see different things. They, they might count a different number of objects or see objects in slightly different ways, look at them um, with respect to different characteristics. Uh, we might have different ideas about how to pack the box, how to fit as many objects into the box as, as possible. So this leads us to some uncertainty into uh, really how many items we might be able to fit into our box. And then we've got to really start to think about the future generations. Okay, because if we, uh, in our generation, take the approach that we want to try and use the space um, as efficiently as possible, put as many objects in it as we possibly can, and still you know, maintain that this idea of, of being below a certain threshold, below a certain carrying capacity, then at some point we get close to that capacity. And then how do we decide who gets to use uh, the capacity that remains? It's like, you know, um, who gets to take the last biscuit from, from the plate? Um, what characteristics should we use to determine um, how uh, that, that space gets used up um, uh, and so on. So, so the, 
the idea is, is, is really it's quite difficult if we start to think about the, the, this box filling up um, and or, or in this case, the, the, the amount of space becoming um, uh, less as we go through. And then the other thing is, if we if we put as many objects into the box as possible, yes, it might be below a certain capacity, um, but isn't that going to be like a surfer trying to stay ahead of a breaking wave, a wave that's trying its best to to crash on top of a surfer? All, the future generation would always have to be trying to stay ahead of that wave, trying to prevent the the growth of the um, the, the debris population. So let's come back to our box, this analogy that we've, we've uh, I've been using. Um, so rather than seeing this box as um, an opportunity to, to fill it, why don't we see this box in, in this state and, and actually take the approach that we want to try and keep it as empty as possible? Because isn't it better to fill it with the, the, the promise of future ideas rather than to fill it with our junk? Um, and, and to take it to the point where there isn't much room for, for anything else. So I come back to this analogy, the glass is half full, glass is half empty analogy. So I'm a glass is half full kind of person. And, you know, I want to see us and uh, take that optimistic approach, but to, to, to basically um, try and get to the point where we remove as many objects from the environment as possible. We, we give the opportunities to the future generation. I'm not a glass is half empty kind of person. And I don't look at the orbital environment as this uh, region that we want to try and fill. So I hope that's given you some ideas to think about. And um, with our panel discussion, perhaps some questions uh, that, that might be raised and that we can talk about. So thanks very much. Well, Hugh, uh, if you're li listening online, thank you for that. That's a fantastic framing um, to the issues that we want to discuss here for the next uh, hour or so. Um, and so I think what we want to do in the panel is um, unpack that box a, a little bit, right? And, and let's explore what do we mean when we say orbital capacity, how might that be measured, and how might that relate to an operational and regulatory context. Um, so we've prepared some questions for the panelists here, and again, there's an app. Please start thinking of questions as we uh, get into the latter half of the panel. We'll want to see those from, uh, from you all. So, Joanne, I'm going to start uh, at, at that end of the row here uh, with a question for you. So, as, we've, as has been mentioned, we're seeing an unprecedented amount of satellites uh, in the form of LEO constellations being filed for through the National Spectrum um, administrations. How do we judge the realism of these, finding, of these filings, and does the current regulatory framework have the capacity to manage this level of activity? Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the Secure World Foundation and the Space Agency. Yes, there is an unprecedented amount of satellites being licensed, and there is an unprecedented amount of satellite filings being made. And this is slowly leading to, and I'm also a glass, glass half full person, <laughs> uh, a stricter approach taken by regulators, applying slightly tighter definitions of what we class as responsibility of states. But this is not consistent across regulators. There's no harmonized approach to this. Now, let's be honest, there is some reservation of spectrum without actual use. There is sometimes a lack of realism. But if I was to judge the realism of filings, how would I do it? Well, I would ask a series of questions to various people. First of all, I'm trying to take a coordinated approach. First of all, I'd ask a question to operators. Is such a large amount of spectrum, if I'm going to completely fill Hughes box, really necessary? Is this necessary to what you want to achieve, what service you want to provide and to, the, um, to the, your customers and clients? What design changes could you actually make to help reduce the dependence on such a large number of the apples in the box, for example? Do you really need them all? Then when I look at a business plan for spectrum, I will assess it in certain ways in regard to before bringing into use, but even once it's brought into use, the monitoring afterwards. For example, the feasibility of actually bringing in to use that system, meeting ITU requirements. Can that operator actually manufacture what they want to manufacture? The supply chain for constellations is getting pretty heavily polluted there. What about being able to launch the required number of satellites because the demand for launchers is, is also tightening? Um, again, 
market. Is the market really there and where they think it is? What about the feasibility of the technology? Where in Hugh's box are the satellites going? Would they work in that to provide the, the market with the services they need? But does the business plan stack up? Does the financial plan stack up? Can they raise the money they need? And how would they compete with other, other LEO constellations, for example? Next, I'd ask a question to the security services. That might seem a bit strange, but I've witnessed reservation spectrum without actual use from very small companies. Actually, they're not very small companies. They're sovereign states looking to block areas of spectrum and areas of LEO constellations. But it wasn't evident until closer to bring into use. Therefore, we need to be savvy and judge the realism of nuances that maybe we haven't really exercised properly before and the purpose of the spectrum filings in NGSO. I'd ask questions for national administrations to the ITU, so many of you sitting in the audience. What procedures, policies and practices will you apply to judge the realism? We're seeing it, we are seeing a tightening up and Ofcom um, are a leading uh, regulator in this regard. But how do you assess the proof of efficient use of spectrum? How do you evidence the launch and operation? Um, do you actually ask for contracts, operation contracts, business plans? How do you assess whether the finance can be raised? And I'm seeing more monitoring, as I mentioned, after BIU. Investors are also increasingly looking as to where filings are being made wh through which national administration. Then I'd also ask if there's a split um, of competencies to the national space agencies. How will you look at your procedures in regard to the assessment of um, whether this can be brought into use, etc. And how will you look at the use of spectrum? Now, I've been involved, luckily, to be involved in the drafting of several national laws and policies around the world, and, and still am. And it's only recently that national regulators are taking sustainability seriously. 25 years ago, it was, it was, it was not cool, to be honest. It was a bit geeky. Mm -hmm. um, and I was one of those geeks, and I'm proud of that. Um, but the focus now on sustainability is absolutely clear. Um, it's no longer just an issue of it's going to cost us more or we're going to race to the bottom with regulators who have a light touch approach. Why? Why? Because it's gone into the culture of, of, of our understanding. It's gone to, the, as the space agency would say, the man who watches X Factor. Your children are much more uh, focused on sustainability than ever before and COP26 has done a lot to that. But also because compliance with sustainability standards hit ESG requirements of investors and allow companies to raise finance. Investors are increasingly requiring a compelling ESG governance plan um, and looking at non-financial factors such as um, looking at material risks and growth of investment opportunities. ESG and sustainability matters to investors. Also, compliance with sustainability requirements allows market access. Now, the US have been leaders in this area for a long time, saying that we will license you terrestrially if you meet sustainability requirements in other countries with your licensing. And lastly, of course, international reputation. So those three criteria are pretty game-changing. Now, to come to Ian's last question, what regulatory challenges and risks does this pose? Well, the long-term sustainability guidelines that we've heard about this morning already are fantastic to achieve international consensus. It's taken 10 years, things move, but they're incredibly important. And I'm very proud of the UK sponsorship of these. They set a stage. There's a buck coming, isn't there? But they're not binding. They need to be applied into national law and the licensing by the entities I've just been talking about. But innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't wait for international law. It doesn't always even wait for national law. Um, therefore, a key challenge that we have is to look at how national laws actually implement the LTS guidelines. We cannot do this in isolation. We have to work internationally and take a holistic approach to regulation. We also need to look at the skills and expertise across national regulators and share information and share I'm not going to use the word best practices, effective practices. And we need international collaboration. So Peter Martinez's uh, idea of the regulatory, regulatory um, engagement is incredibly important. We also need to learn from each other on how industry actually implement these standards to test the realism of the spectrum filings. We also have a few tools that we can use. We have international environmental law. And we have already conservation use 
in, on planet Earth that we can use in space. We need to protect the next generation of space activities as we protect the next generation of terrestrial activities. We also have sustainability tools, and there's been a lot of debate at IEDC and ISO in the, in the last few days. Um, now, recently, I've worked with some of our excellent UK representatives to these standards and organisations and done a gap analysis of what is missing in the standards. You won't be surprised that there are very important things missing. For example, collision avoidance capabilities and measuring during mission and deorbit, visual brightness, particularly for our astronomers in the audience and the need for preserving our dark skies, also for indigenous populations, non-reflective circuit. Uh, surfaces, separation of constellations, etc., close approach capture missions. So linked to what I've just mentioned in regards to financial incentives, market access and insurance incentives, I would call on industry to help close those gaps and make sure that that international level can be implemented at national level and then implemented into industry practices, meeting investor, insurance and and, and raising money linked to, linked to these incentives. It's really important to encourage investment, cheaper insurance, and sustainable behavior. We need to create this ecosystem that's with appropriate incentives to make this happen. And lastly, we also need to, first of all, start with what is up there already, and what do we actually mean by sustainable use? Easy. <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Joanne. And maybe there are a number of points in there that. Uh, we could expand on in our, in our comments here. So I, I think we'll reflect back on, on a lot of what you've raised as we go through this. So um, on your read, I think part of the, the thread that Joanne was talking about is, is the complexity and the increasing number of actors in this system. Um, one of the types of new actors that we see are new regulatory um, actors as well. So the Rwanda Space Agency, for example, is a relatively new regulatory actor, is a relatively new space agency, in fact. Can you tell us about what steps and measures you are taking in building regulatory capacity and process for space activities in Rwanda. Thank you so much, Ian, and uh, um, thank you for allowing uh, me to participate in this uh, session of today. Um, perhaps I can start with a little bit about the Rwanda Space Program journey. So initially, Space Program has started as department um, under Rwanda Regulatory Authority. Um, until the establishment of Rwanda Space Agency in 2020, which means that Rwanda had some skilled people in terms of space matters, and the same skill were transferred from uh, rural to Rwanda Space Agency to run it. So it's a, I think it's, it's a chance for, for Rwanda Space Agency to have, or to Rwanda to have that kind of structure that help uh, to, uh, Rwanda Space Agency to start with the, the right people in place. For example, our Chief Technology Officer is a, a report of CPM Chapter 4 on satellite regulatory issues, which means that he was, uh, he was, what, or he was appointed for that because of his uh, uh, competence. So uh, secondary capacity building is among our top uh, priorities as Rwanda Space Agents, because we want to develop program, we want to, to develop, uh, to, to develop the, the uh, our space sector, so we, it's better to have the, the like the uh, the develop work uh, so that we can have the force uh, the, the force that are needed in, in the market. Another thing, it's uh, through the cooperation with regional and international bodies with similar mission uh, as uh, Rwanda Space Agents, we have participated in different events, workshops, seminars that contribute to the capacity development. Uh, for example, this year we have participated in different working groups, established the under, uh, under legal subcommittee of COPIUS, and, and uh, one of those working groups was about the general exchanges of view on potential legal models, activities in the exploration, exploitation, and utilization of space resources, um, which means that uh, through those participation, it's where we gain the uh, we gain much experience and uh, the, the best practice from, from uh, other different actors. Again, we have participated in the ITU WTTC of, of 2020, and we have recently hosted the workshop in partnership with GSOA, Global Satellite Operators Associations, uh, together with other African space agents, where satellite licensing framework and principles were part of the discussions. <clears throat> 
So um, again, um, being part of the global space community, we have signed different um, international space international treaties, um, and we are in the process of ratifying those so that, so that can be part of our domestic laws. So we. Again, with the support of UNOSA, we have started draft, the drafting process of our national space law, and we are aiming to complete, it, uh, to complete the process by this year. So uh, putting all those uh, things together, they are enables like, to, to have the, uh, like to have the experience and also to learn from different actors and also from the different international organizations on the best practice in terms of the uh, regulatory uh, processes and regulatory framework in terms of the space activities. So uh, in summary, that's what I can say, in uh, what we are doing uh, or, or what are the processes we are using in, uh, in space activities in Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Uh, and so it's an interesting thing, you know, and part of our challenge is that we have mature space agencies or mature regulatory structures which have frameworks that have been developed and have to be adapted to this new environment. And then there are opportunities for emerging and new actors to design frameworks from the, from the ground. And I think part of our collective challenge in dealing with this, this um, uh, context is, is how to work within that, in that contrast. So um, I'm gonna turn to uh, a, an operator perspective now. So John, Viasat has been very active on the topic of orbital carrying capacity over recent years. Can you share a little bit of a why and what your interest is? Uh, sure, uh, very easy to answer. I guess I'd, I'd start with the perspective that uh, we don't think oursel of ourselves as an operator. Um, <laughs> we think of ourselves as a technology company. The company's been around for about 36 years. Um, and even before the founding of the company, our, our founder and executive chairman uh, was working on LEO projects as part of earlier careers. Um, so, you know, over the course of that time period, uh, we have uh, designed and built payloads for LEO satellites, some very big names you know. We've built uh, ground networks uh, for LEO systems, some very big names you know. Uh, we build user terminals for LEO systems, some very big names you know. Um, it probably isn't very well known, but we do have some uh, LEO satellites in orbit. Um, so we see great promise for LEO, um, and we think we're just at the beginning of really be, being able to understand what can be done in low Earth orbit. Uh, costs of access to space have dropped. <clears throat> we have the ability to mass produce um, assets that can be launched into space in a way we couldn't. And we think there's great potential for communications, uh, for Earth observation, Earth sensing, weather, those types of things, uh, position positioning, navigation, and timing, which increasingly needs to be supplemented in low Earth orbit, not just what's done with GPS, but in lower orbits, defense, security. Um, and we think that every nation in the world is going to be able to participate in this economy in a way they couldn't in the past. So we're, we're very excited about that, and we want to be part of bringing those solutions to the world. We envision partnering uh, with governments, uh, with technology companies, with operators, to help make this all a reality. Uh, and I think our, our big concern is twofold. Uh, one, uh, if you go back to Hugh's analogy, and I hadn't thought about it this way until Hugh presented, um, let's assume today there's a full glass of water, which is opportunity. Um, everybody around the world should be able to take a sip from that glass of water. And we shouldn't have one or two companies or one or two countries guzzling the entire glass and leaving everyone else thirsty. So we have to figure out a way to coexist and to share that resource. I agree with you that we need to figure out a way to use it efficiently, to pack it efficiently, but everybody has to be able to be part of that process. And I agree with Joanne that 
we shouldn't fill it all up today because we're not smart enough to know what's going to come in the future. So we need to start thinking about ways to use the asset in a way that accommodates today's needs and tomorrow's needs. Uh, and I, I saw something very recent that was enlightening to me. Um, ESPY uh, in Europe uh, put together a very thoughtful um, paper and a very thoughtful slide deck. And the way they depicted it really resonated with me. If you think of low Earth orbit as essentially a beaker, um, you know, what you put in affects how quickly you fill it up but also what tools you bring to bear determine how much you can put in there. And there's a lot of debate these days uh, about space uh, traffic management and situational awareness and debris remediation. Those are all very important principles and important things to pursue. Um, but I don't think we know necessarily what are the most effective tools because we don't know how much we're working with. And if we determine you know, how big this cylinder is and how much we filled it up, then we can figure out what to do to maximize the opportunities. Um, I personally believe that one of the most effective things we can do is facilitate more responsible satellite design and operation. And if satellites are designed more efficiently to have less impact, I think we're going to be able to put more in orbit. And I also think the burdens on space situational awareness and space traffic management and even debris remediation will be lesser. So a cruder way to look at it is, let's not junk up space in the first instance. Let's be smart about what we put up and then figure out how to manage it. And if you really think about this, it makes good business sense, and it's all really also is important for a matter of you know, corporate and social responsibility. So that's why we're as committed to these initiatives as we are. All right, well, thank you, and then uh, we'll continue to, uh, to explore that. So Richard, something that was raised in, in John's remarks just then was, you know, what is the, the size of the box, if you will? How do we define what that cylinder is? And we have, I'm gonna call an audible, we actually have a question as well from the, from the audience already submitted about, you know, can we put a number um, on that given current, um, given, if current regulatory and technical conditions remain the same? So you are amongst the research community that, that, is, that is looking at how various concepts for defining carrying capacity. Can you, Tell us a little bit about what you're working on and, and how you see these, see these issues. Yeah, definitely. So definitely, Hugh Lewis provided an excellent introduction to the topic. Hugh has made significant contributions in this area, so I'm, I'm honored to be part of this panel where he introduced. Um, so I like that analogy, apples fitting in a box. So one of the things we work on are two levels, two different types of capacity. Intrinsic capacity, which is the physical positioning of satellites on orbit. Given that you know where everything is, and then risk-based capacity, which is a probabilistic calculation. We're not sure where all the debris are. There's lethal, non-trackable debris up there. We're not sure what the future is gonna look like. So there's a probabilistic element of capacity. We work on both sides of this problem. We've done some significant work on the intrinsic capacity. So this is using orbital theory, astrodynamics, very fun math, to calculate how many spherical objects can we pack on orbit. Now the calculation is not as simple as you might imagine. Maybe you might you know, sort of take a first cut at this by looking at the volume in space and equally dividing that volume and saying, okay, well, how big are my uh, slots? How big are you know, the, the regions that I wanna fit satellites? Well, let's subdivide that volume uh, by the volume of each slot. It's not that simple because we have orbital mechanics. So Kepler has something to say about the problem. And then one way to think about it is there's two numbers that bound that quantity, the intrinsic capacity. One of the numbers is the volume, the sphere packing volume. It's obviously not that. The other number is if I consider one circular orbit, right? So one circular orbit at that shell, and I subdivide that circular orbit in, in degrees, and the degrees are gonna be the slot size. So I subdivide that circular orbit, let's say one degree 
slot size. So that's 360 slots in one circular orbit. It's obviously not that number because you can fit more than one circular orbit. Somewhere between those two numbers, we find what the intrinsic capacity is, and it's a complicated number based on inclination and orbital characteristics. So my group, we do that calculation. We have numbers that we've computed for the intrinsic capacity, but that's not the capacity of low Earth orbit because there's debris up there that we can't fit into neat slots. The, our knowledge of the debris is probabilistic. So I actually like to extend Hugh's analogy of those apples. Now think about a second analogy, a probabilistic analogy. I have apples in my hand, I have that same basket, and I'm dropping the apples, right? So where the apples fall is somewhat probabilistic, there might be a gust in the room, so there's a sort of probability density function where I could expect each apple to fall. Now I wanna figure out what sequence should I drop these apples so I have them fall in the basket and they don't touch each other. That's the realistic analogy of orbital capacity, and there's folks that are doing those kind of calculations. Those calculations are based on source sync models, Monte Carlo simulations, and heuristic codes. Our group, we do that kind of calculation as well, and we try to marry that calculation with an intrinsic capacity. So, going back to your question, can we place a number on it? Well, I'd, I'd say it's complicated, and in some cases it actually might be irresponsible to place a number on it, because it depends on so many factors. It depends on how accurately you can avoid collisions. It depends on your mission disposal rate. So if you place a number and you don't nuance it with all of these other characteristics, then companies might shoot for that number, organizations might shoot for that number, but they don't meet all the other requirements that they need to have that level of capacity. Mission disposal rate, collision avoidance uh, probability accuracy. So uh, we can compute numbers, and we actually want, we want to do is compute ranges of numbers, and in the future, hopefully, regulators can look at the key parameters in those numbers and make sure in the filings that companies are achieving those parameters. Um, but to answer your question, uh, it, it's tricky, but we do have numbers that we've computed, but they depend on, on a lot of assumptions. All right, thank you for that. So, uh, Akhil, I'm, I'm gonna turn to you. Um, and uh, the, the, the question I wanna ask you is, uh, we've been talking about physical assessments of capacity. You come from a different discipline. You come from the economics discipline, the behavioral science discipline. Can you uh, tell us your perspective as you look at this from, um, from your backgrounds? Are there competitive or economic factors that we might also consider as part of a capacity discussion? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, so, whoa, <laughs> that was surprising. So I would say that the physical factors obviously matter. They do, right? You can't fit a size 10 foot into a size five shoe and we gotta know how big the shoe is so that we can figure out if it fits or not. So that's important. But that's about where I think a lot of these terrestrial analogies that we're used to thinking about start to break down. Because the real binding constraint, I think, for how much stuff we can fit in orbit is the costs that we're willing to incur to put stuff into orbit. I would say that the real metric of orbital carrying capacity, unlike other terrestrial resources, is a cost-benefit test. When we put things into orbit, we are going to incur some costs. As we keep things there, we are going to incur some costs. We're also gonna be receiving some benefits. Do those benefits match or exceed the costs? And that's a dynamic calculation that's going to be changing over time as technology changes. It's going to be changing over time as the state of the orbital environment changes. It's also going to be changing with competitive behavior. So let me try to give you some examples here to, to build some intuition for how this might work, right? Let's say that it costs a trillion dollars to launch any single satellite anywhere. How many satellites are we gonna launch? It doesn't matter how big the shoe is or how big the box is. A trillion dollars per satellite in today's economy, are you kidding me? Like, we're not gonna launch anything, right? On the other hand, let's say that we launched a satellite and it costs like 10 cents. How many satellites can we fit in there? Well, we're gonna get pretty close to whatever those physical limits are. And that's when the physical limits start to really bind. Now, it's somewhere in between 10 cents and a trillion dollars to launch a satellite. So we're probably going to launch some satellites, but we're probably not going to get close to the physical limits anytime soon. And, you know, that's maybe okay. As we start to think about an era where commercial users are a dominant force in orbit, we really need to think about these economic factors, about costs and benefits. What are the benefits that we get from having satellites in orbit? Who gets those benefits? What are the costs we incur and how are those going to change? As the environment gets filled with debris, with lethal non-trackables, it will become costlier to operate satellites there. The number of satellites which pass the cost-benefit test that individual operators are going to be doing 
is going to shrink. And that's going to be true even if we have all the best guidance and control algorithms to tell us you know, this is how you move the thing and so forth. The other thing that I didn't really talk about too much here is competition, right? Now, let's say that we're talking about a commercial operator. Let's say that your revenues are starting to fall from maintaining satellites in orbit. Let's say that only one operator is able to make substantial revenues from being in orbit. Even if there's plenty of physical space, not a lot of folks are gonna be launching there. The carrying capacity of that region will be greatly diminished and not because of a physical limitation, because of an economic limitation. Competitive behavior or anti-competitive behavior can absolutely drive how many satellites can stay in orbit. In orbit, a little bit different from terrestrial settings, competitive and anti-competitive behavior doesn't just have to be in terms of pricing strategies or product strategies. It can also be in terms of how you place your objects, what kinds of avoidance maneuvers you do. If you are a large operator, you have the power, maybe not the inclination, maybe not the willingness, maybe even a responsibility to not do this, but you have the power to use the way that you maneuver your satellites to make it prohibitively costly for others to enter that region, whether or not they can physically fit there. So this element, this competitive element, this economic element is something that we think about in many other settings. Like when we talk about fisheries regulation, we think a lot about prices and costs and quantities. When we talk about spectrum regulation on Earth, we think a lot about who's buying the spectrum in which auctions, how much they're paying, and what they're going to do with it. Are they going to be doing anti-competitive mergers? We think about this. In orbit, I don't think we have really started to think about this, but these are absolutely critical factors that will drive how many satellites and whose satellites, importantly, can be in which locations. All right. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, roughly a half hour left. I see a good number of audience questions, so please keep submitting them. We won't get to them all, but please keep submitting them. And you can um, also, of course, uh, upvote um, the ones that, that you really want us to ask up here. And so I'm going to weave, start weaving some of those audience questions into our discussion here as we go and um, see where this journey takes us. So uh, on your read, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so. Uh, I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about your current practice for managing large constellations. As we're all aware, there's been a particularly large filing uh, that has come through Rwanda uh, for, I believe, 300, uh, sorry, I believe for 300 satellites in the filing. Now, we've talked a little bit about how we evaluate the realism of those filings already. But I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you, within uh, Rwanda and, and your colleague agencies, um, manage and look at these large constellations, what concerns might be reviewed during the licensing process, e.g. space debris, spectrum sharing, those sorts of, those sorts of things. Thank you so much. Um, our current practice for managing large constellations, we have uh, different things that we, look, we looked at, but uh, I'm going to highlight uh, the key ones. First of all, our filing license process comply with the radio regulation on ITU, which is a key regulation in filing. But in addition to that, Rwanda considers different things in terms of filing process. Uh, first of all, we, we, we check the spectrum efficiency, uh, uh, where we privilege the shared spectrum to the exclusive ones. So if we want to, to, like to, to have, uh, to manage the spectrum efficiency, for, for everyone like to, to be able or just to have the equal right in terms of the use of space. So it's, it's, it's uh, very important to like to, to, to focus mainly on the shared spectrum compared to those ex ex exclusive ones. Again, we examine the, if the operator will be, uh, uh, will be uh, using the space irresponsibly. So in that case, we, we, we require the, uh, the capability of the operator in terms of debris mitigation as a spare, uh, based on the space debris mitigation guidelines of the component piece to use of outer space. So we, we, we want to ensure that that operator will, 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 um, um, uh, will use the space responsibly. So he needs or she, he requires to show that he will, he will be able to mitigate the space debris. Again, uh, we assess the financial capability of the operators because we want to ensure the efficiency and provision of services. So <clears throat> it is very important to, to examine that because uh, 
um, everyone can come and say that I'm able to do that, but after a given period, he will not be able to comply with uh, all the requirements in terms of the capability, in terms of the financial capability. So it is very important to assess. So as Rwanda Space Agents, we, 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 we focus on that. So we have different uh, things, but those are the key ones in terms of the space sustainability that, that, that we are focusing in terms of uh, uh, giving the right, the fair license to uh, someone who requests on that. Thank you. Thank you. So part of what I'm taking away from that answer is that for the spectrum side of this, we have established metrics and processes for comparing against those metrics. For the physical aspect of such a large constellation, we don't necessarily have those metrics established as part of our, our, our regulatory process, right? So uh, I'm gonna ask a series of questions to, to the panelists here to kind of explore that thread a little bit about you know, what it would mean to potentially have those sorts of, of metrics available. So Richard, uh, Akil, for the, for the two of you, um, We've heard about several research efforts underway to define orbital carrying capacity from physical um, attributes, economic attributes. What is needed to mature this work towards operational relevance? And John, if you want to jump in as well, I'd be happy to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, that's a good question. I'll start because I think my response will probably dovetail with a comment from yours. So uh, the way I think about capacity is a manifold, right? And it's a manifold of capacity and risk. So if you're willing to accept high levels of risk, then there might be collisions on orbit that uh, basically um, destroy satellites, but you need to launch more satellites than you anticipate that you need. So the risk level is really tied into this capacity question. You can get higher capacity, but it's gonna be highly risky to do that. And this comes from the probabilistic argument that we can't really bring debris down to zero because we can't track everything. So there's still a small probability that there's debris up there that will destroy your satellite. So it's a trade of risk versus capacity. Now the question is where do we fall on that risk curve? We don't know yet, right? So there are other much more mature technology industries that we know of, such as the car industry, consumer electronics industry, and there's a certain level of accepted risk uh, in those industry, um, you know, how frequently does a laptop fail or a phone that I have to replace uh, during warranty, how frequently does that fail? I'm not an economics person, so I can't really do that study for, for space, but it's pretty clear from the physical uh, sort of attributes of satellites that it is a manifold of capacity versus risk. And I think regulators and folks that are trying to do that calculation will need to understand what risk level is acceptable. Is it acceptable that we will have five collisions? next year? Do you think that's fine? Or do you think that the public is going to come back and say, this is not acceptable? Um, so that's the way that I view it. And I'd love to hear how you guys view it too. Yeah, I think uh, that manifold perspective is, is very much how I would think about this as well. Um, I might frame it maybe in terms of a different metric, right? Risk and sort of willingness or ability to accept risk. And you know, in economics, we talk a lot about willingness to pay or ability to pay. When regulators make a determination about, you know, 5%, picking a number out of a hat here, 5% is an acceptable risk level. Anyone who is willing to accept a higher risk level, they're going to have to rethink how they're making their mission, how they're designing their trade space operationally so that they can get below that 5% threshold. Now, maybe some of them can, maybe some of them can't. So when we do this, we're going to be making a decision about who is using orbital space, right? We don't all have the same valuation of risk here. And that's something I think for regulators to be sensitive to and to try to elicit these risk preferences, right? We need to understand who has what types of risk preferences. And when we set these thresholds, who is it that we're kind of zoning in to orbital space and who is it that we're zoning out? Uh, I think a zoning framing is maybe another useful way to think about this. In many parts of the world, you know, there's, there's very strict zoning regulations about who goes where. And when you make these zoning decisions, you are setting in place land use patterns that will determine a lot of how that region evolves, of who pays what costs to access the region, and how they are able to use it or not able to use it, right? Um, I live in Vermont, and we have some very interesting zoning regulations there. If you follow U.S. property prices, you'll know that uh, Vermont has recently, it's, it's gone straight to the moon, right, in, in property price terms. Um, 
But I think the other thing that we really need here is we need much better data collection, right? I mentioned that we need to elicit risk preferences. We need to elicit a whole lot more than that. We need to elicit a lot of economic data Similar to how we collect data, again, I want to mention fisheries. We have pretty great data on fisheries. I could tell you, you know, with a few minutes at a computer, like, what is the average price received by a fishing boat in the Gulf of Mexico in a given month under a given condition? I could do that. I can't do that in space. I've tried, right? We have very sort of rough aggregate data, and we need to get much, much better data so that we can gain a fuller picture of the these sorts of trade spaces. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess I would I would say I think Richard's on the right track. Uh, I think we have we all acknowledge we have more work to do, uh, but it's important we do it now. Um, the the rules, the standards, the norms that currently exist were developed for a very different time. That doesn't mean they were wrong when they were adopted. They were adopted based on what we knew and the data we had. Um, and let me just try an analogy. Um, you know, there's a certain standard out there uh, that's been used historically, uh, you know, traditionally for geostationary satellites. It's a collision risk metric, you know, and it's one in a thousand. Right? And I kind of liken it to, I'm American, as you might guess by the accent, Right? I come, I come to, to London and you know, sometimes I cross the street without looking. Sometimes I don't look to the right even though it's painted on the street. Right? I'm taking a chance. If I do that once, eh, maybe I'm okay. But if I keep doing it, I'm probably going to get hit by a bus. And that's what's starting to happen with these large constellations. We're dealing with massive quantities of satellites and huge numbers of things that are called conjunctions, which are, if you will, near misses in space. And the standards that we're using to manage those risks are, are based on a different era. And I think we really need to sit down and understand you know, how many times is somebody going to be crossing the street? How close is the bus coming? And do we need to do something different going forward? You know, some, some notable experts have, have said, based on the data they've seen, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when we will start seeing collisions. And I think we really need to understand how likely that is to occur and how many uh, there are. So I think we're on the right path. There's a lot of excellent research out there. And I think the best thing to move it forward is to get it out there, get the models out, let people poke at them. And what that will do, like it always occurs with science, it'll improve our thinking, it'll lead to better decisions. One thing that troubles me though, um, I've had discussions with, with people in government about these issues, and I think, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as Peter mentioned at the beginning, we've gone a long way in two years. If you had this discussion two years ago, pre-COVID, everybody would look at you like you're crazy, right? A minister wouldn't give you the time of day. They thought this was all technically geeky. We've moved really far in two years, right? As Peter said, we have a problem. Now we're working on solutions. But what troubles me in discussing with some regulators is they'll say, we don't know what we're doing. I'll say, well, that's okay, but if you don't know what you're doing, why are you licensing these systems without understanding the consequences? And the silence was deafening. So that's one thing I'd ask everyone to think about. Knowing what we know, does it make sense to catch our breath Right? Let the experts continue to develop their work, and then knowing a little bit more. We don't have to be perfect. Right, Richard, we, if we get your work to you know, within an order of magnitude of accuracy, I think we'll lo know a whole lot more than we know today. For sure. So that's my suggestion. Yeah, so I'm going to actually pick up on that and come to Joanne and then back to Anya Reed. And so before I do that, there was a question from the audience about does, is the size of the box limited by our SSA and, and space tracking capabilities? And I think to an extent it, it, it is, is informed by that, right? I don't know, limited is the right word, but it is certainly informed by that, right? So 
Joanne and Anurit. I'm going to come to you, Joanne, first, Anurit, second. So this conversation that, that John and Richard were just having, we, we get Richard's work and his colleagues' work to a point where it's within an order of magnitude. That's great. That doesn't mean the regulators are going to have the capacity or the capability to use that, right? So how do we, what needs to be done to make this concept, um, the capacity and the, and the relevance in the regulatory system, um, what needs to be done to kind of bring that alongside the, the research? I think that's a very, very good question. It almost looks like we're applying something like ITU Resolution 49 and really looking at the due diligence um, of, of applications, looking what is available in the capacity and acting almost as now, this is dreadful for all regulators, bouncers, as to, <laughs> as to access or admittance criteria to the party that is a constellation. Um, but how do we decide who goes in to that party? How do we decide what is equitable access? How do we ensure equitable access? How do we come back to John's to make sure that we protect future generations? How do we effectively act as, as bouncers to this? So I come back to what I said at the, the opening comments. Um, at national level, uh, states have the, the duty to authorise and continually supervise, but they can't do this in isolation. Otherwise, the bouncers don't have the information standing at the door of the consolation party to actually work out who can be admitted or not. Um, the, bouncing, the bouncer's staying, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, the bouncer needs the regulatory expertise and knowledge of actually how this affects, but actually taking a holistic approach, the commercial, the financial, the economic, the technical, and the competitive expertise, and all and take, to take that holistic view. Now, that's not easy, and that's an awful lot that we're asking for the bouncers to have there, but it's really important to, to deal with at an international holistic level. So, on your reach, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, thank you. What I can add, it's just, uh, um, there is a key role in terms of the um, in terms of the research. So uh, when when the researchers or technical parts or technical people when they come up with the recommendation, so it's the question is uh, as you ask, it's, uh, what it, are you, you are wondering if they or like regulator if they have the capacity of uh, like implementing those uh, recommendations. So what I can say it's a uh, like learning, it's uh, you should always learning on the based on the best practice and also the the available resources that are there. So um, as as Rihanna said, um, no one uh, country or no one regulator can can work in isolation. So there is a need of collaboration. There is a need of uh, like uh, uh, having like uh, the. the uh, the continuous uh, uh, raising awareness in terms of the space activities, in terms of the space, uh, like uh, in terms of the space uh, uh, capacity. So it's uh, the, the, the something that which which is needed. It's it's to have like uh, always learning and also have the collaboration. Of who is doing better? Who is like uh, relatively like uh, doing the effective uh, thing in terms of the managing space? So. I think the important thing is it's just uh, the, the political way and also the um, ability to learn from others. That's what I can say. Yeah, and both of those are, are, are great points, right? It's, it's how do we share knowledge, lessons learned within our own community, and then how do we respond to external communities to build political uh, visibility, right? All right, so we have about 15 minutes remaining and way too many questions <laughs> to get to into that 15 minutes. So I apologies to the audience for that. Um, we're going to do some lightning round here. So I'm gonna direct the question to a specific panelist and you get one minute uh, or, or less, all right? So, um, uh, Joanne, first one to you. Uh, what is the role of standards bodies like ISO or national standards bodies in addressing this, this problem and some of the gaps you talked about? So a bit like the long-term sustainability guidelines, we need some consensus. They set the stage. They actually allow research to be done and they allow international collaboration. But one thing about the standards bodies that I was discussing earlier, and I, I've been saying this for 20 years, could industry please get there to the meetings and actually have a voice? It's really important. So at the moment, it tends to be states that attend ISO and IEDC, which are both incredibly important. And 
well chaired by the UK. And, um, but it's really, really important industry attend and get their voice. So standards are really, really important. There are lots of gaps in standards. And let's roll up our sleeves, fill those gaps, and take a more holistic approach to sustainability. Thank you. Akhil, uh, you made a great point earlier on the importance of cost-benefit analysis. But how do we evaluate this when the costs and benefits are occurred by different stakeholders? Yeah, that's a great question. So one way to think about this is what are the costs and benefits that a regulator is going to look at as salient? Now, that's not going to be the most equitable way to make these decisions, but practically, that's probably an operationalizable way to make these decisions. So push it back to the regulators. The regulators have a mission. You know, The Federal Reserve, for example, has a dual mandate, inflation and unemployment in the US. That's what they look at. So do we need orbital regulators, whoever takes that role, to have a mandate that tells them what they look at. That might help. All right, thank you. Uh, so Richard, would it be a good idea to at least agree on the size of the current problem and how to measure it? How do we develop common models and tools? So that's a tough one for a minute. Can we agree? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah I think we can definitely agree. Um, you just talking to John this morning, and you know, from your perspective as, as an operator, technology company, I think we agree on the physics, we agree on the equations, we agree on the models. Uh, we're both engineers, I think we can agree on that. Now, the question is, the results of the model, I think that should be a public debate. I think, I think everyone should have an input, like the models will have nuances. It won't be one single answer, because if you adjust parameters, there'll be nuances. And I think we got to bring in the public. We got to bring in uh, sort of different kinds of operators, uh, the international public, and have a debate. Uh, because there's only so much that the technical piece can tell you. It's not going to solve the problem. Because this is clearly an economics problem, clearly a regulatory problem. So yeah, I, th I think that's the way forward, which is have the models in the open, have some open source capability where they can be probed and analyzed, and let's have a public debate about it. All right. John, uh, is this about risk uh, in, in specific orbits, complete system risk, or individual satellite risk? Run that by me. OK, yeah. Uh, OK, so let me, let me try and read this a little more directly. So should we be focusing on limiting risk in orbit or limiting the number of satellites in orbit? Is this about uh, complete system risk, so environmental risk, or is it risk to uh, individual Operators. It's about the risk to the ecosystem yeah. because there are interactions among all of these different elements. Right? And, the, and the best example I can give you um, is the world's outrage, justifiably so, I would add, about the ASAT test uh, that occurred in November where we had an intentional uh, collision of two objects that spread orbital debris over many hundreds of orbits, hundreds of, of kilometers of orbits. Uh, and that debris will persist uh, for decades or as much as a century of more. So action by one satellite operator at a given altitude can have consequences for people seeking to operate above and below. Um, so I think we need to we consider need to consider the entirety of the situation uh, because it does potentially affect all nations, all operators. All right, thank you. And we have a panel tomorrow specifically talking about uh, that event and what we're doing about it um, in, in the community. So, yeah. Um, all right. Um, there's a question here about uh, whether our, uh, regulators have considered requiring bonds for post-mission disposal. The FCC has uh, solicited several rounds of comments on a proposal just like that. That's the Federal Communications Commission in the, in the U.S. Um, that is still being considered. Um, so it's, a, it's an idea that is certainly out there. I don't believe it's been implemented um, anywhere. So. Um, Anurit, uh, so there's a question here about the relationship of satellite constellations and the applications and services those constellations provide to uh, national economic and sustainable development. Um, so just curious from your perspective, um, what can we do, what can regulators, policymakers do to ensure that internet connectivity and satellite constellations do provide the benefits that they're, that they're offering? Um, what I can say is just um, that the regulator should um, 
act responsibly. So um, the reason why I'm saying that it's uh, that um, in any action that will be take, that will be taken by a regulator in his respective um, area, so it will affect the, the whole world. So it's a uh, it's it's a very important to, like to, to to act responsibly in whatever decision that you that you are going that you are going to take. Thank you. And so this one is for everybody. It is a quick answer as well. Um, geostationary orbit is used in an ordered way. We have slots, and we have an allocation process for those slots. Those slots have a spectrum asset, and they also effectively have a physical um, attribute to them as well. Right? Um, do we see the possibility of regulating LEO in a similar manner, so a slot-based manner or such a structured uh, manner? Anyone who wishes to, to take that on? I'll start first. Uh, we have a 2019 paper called uh, 2D Lattice Constellations for Leo Slotting. And uh, it's complicated. It's complicated because, well, there's, a, there's a one inclination at geo. There's one inclination, which is zero degrees, and there's one altitude. If you want to have multiple operators operating at the same altitude at different inclinations, because mm -hmm. of J2 effects, their constellations are gonna drift relative to each other, and they're gonna have a lot of conjunction events, and they're gonna to have to orchestrate a dance on orbit. So it's complicated to have slots. Um, it makes sense, if you wanna have slots in LEO, it makes sense to slot uh, a shell, an orbital shell. It's clearly uh, fairly easy to slot in altitude. A lot of the filings uh, effectively do that. They designed for a range of altitudes, about 30 kilometers. In our recent paper, which is efficient, efficient stacking of large constellations, uh, we found that 30 kilometers is obviously way too big, uh, but you can actually reasonably get away with an altitude separation of a few kilometers. Uh, so I think what we need to do is, as more filings come in, uh, go back to the, to the individuals that have allocated 30 kilometers of altitude space and say, do you really need that, like you said earlier? Because I don't think they do. I think some of those altitude uh, allocations have to do with their planned operations. How, how they're going to raise into their orbit, how are they going to operate, and that can be coordinated between operators. And this is where we need the international harmonized and, and uh, consistent approach, and it comes back also to what one aspect of GEO is equitable use and allowing access to the next generation. So this is where I'm afraid uh, we need a multidisciplinary approach and an international approach with um, lawyers working with uh, engineers, etc., to actually make the possible possible. I'll maybe add a quick dismal note here. The valuation <laughs> problem for Leo slots is tremendous. Like it is, it is a fiendishly complicated beast. So uh, we've got some folks from the FCC here. The FCC runs spectrum auctions in the US. Those are very difficult auctions, uh, combinatorial auctions. The space of possible choices that you could make as a bidder in those auctions is immense. Now we don't auction orbital slots and I don't imagine that we will. There's, I hear legal challenges to that, yes. but if you are an operator who's trying to figure out what you are willing to pay for a slot, and if we are going to define the slotting architecture in this way, it's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. Like, it is at least as hard as the combinatorial auctions that we run for spectrums, and then some with lethal non-trackables and, and so forth. Like, yeah. computationally, just, it's a beast. And so, even if we do get these slotting architectures, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what we expect operators to practically do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have two thoughts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say the first steps aren't that hard. I think there's two things that can be done immediately in low Earth orbit, and I think the first one is really easy to understand. If you think of you know, orbit just as, for simplicity as a matter of altitudes, and I realize there's, there's more to deal with than that, you know, most of the operators today are operating within relatively tight tolerances, a few kilometers above and below their nominal altitudes. It's kind of like a lane on the freeway. We probably can do better than that, but that's a good starting point. But some of them are seeking authority to operate across as much as 100 kilometers of altitude. That's kind of like going down the freeway. <laughs> and veering across all of the lanes. Nobody can get by you. The first thing we need to do to make sure we can share this, these resources is to keep people to reasonable tolerances. And that can easily be done today. We don't need international standards. It really is a matter of national regulators saying to people, 
be responsible. Stay within a reasonable tolerance. Make sure there's room for others on the freeway. I know we're not here to talk about spectrum, but another thing we can do in terms of reasonableness is work on the concept of angular separation. Uh, it's a concept that's been used for 50 years in the commercial industry that has allowed geo operators to share spectrum even though they're using the same frequencies, they point in different directions, and having those rules has enabled innovation. It's allowed new operators to enter the field, it's brought us new services and new technologies and robust competition, and we need something like that in the LEO area to make sure there's continued room for innovation in the future. Thank you. Anurit, do you have anything you want to uh, add on this one? No, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, we have just a, a, a couple of minutes left, and there's an issue that has come, a topic that has come up several times. And we've already talked about this a little bit, and it came up yesterday for those of us that participated in the regulator to regulator dialogue, and that is this topic of, of equity and, and future access, right? And that is, to me, one of the, the core issues in this discussion. Um, we can do things now. But that doesn't mean that that will enable the things that we want to or don't even know we want to do uh, in the future. Uh, so the question from the audience is, referring back to Hugh's talk, who determines what is the entity or the, and, and, and it's, it's a very difficult question, right? But how do you determine how to represent that future stakeholder equity in policy decisions? And I think this is, I think, something we all need to think about and, and discuss. We have a coffee break next. I would love to have conversation around that in, in the coffee break. But if any of our panels have a, have a thought on that equity question, that future promise question, and how we represent that value in, in, in policy decisions around this topic. Yeah. Shall, shall I just start? So sometimes, sometimes the two most reliable laws are the laws of big numbers and uh, big objects, and secondly, Murphy's Law. Um, <laughs> one, the more we put up there, the more likely it is that Murphy's Law kicks in and, and errors happen and mistakes happen. So therefore, I come back to two standards and trying to take this holistic approach. And also, in regard to standards, look at um, disposal and demise, really, really importantly. Now, what's interesting at a national level um, and terrestrial level is there's lots of case law now, going back to real law, um, um, about climate change and the responsibilities of states and responsibilities of nations. And there's been a recent case saying we all have a duty to the generations unborn. I think that's a fantastic concept. So how do we apply this to the, um, environmental law and outer space to the generations unborn? We look at proper demise, proper disposal, and actually do our research again. I actually work with you guys to look at how we do this properly in space and how we get things back down and how we clean up and then make sure that that protection of the generations unborn and all the good things and innovations that we don't even see yet. <laughs> yeah. So let's protect the generations unborn through really clear clarity of standards. Oh, mm. again, add a dismal note here. <laughs> Articles one and two of the Outer Space Treaty really constrain what we can do right now in terms of equity. And they do that because they effectively say that if you are able to get up there, if you can get the regulatory approvals, if you perceive a big enough benefit relative to the cost that you incur, you can go there, right? We don't have any way right now to say we're going to cordon off regions of orbital space for these future generations. In the property market, you can absolutely do that. I could buy a plot of land somewhere, you know, maybe not a, a freehold in, in London, right? But like <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, maybe in Vermont with enough money, I could buy a plot of land and people do this. They say, I'm going to keep this for conservation purposes. I'm not going to build anything here. We don't have the mechanisms in place to do that in orbit and our legal structures, well-intentioned though they are, limit our ability to build those mechanisms right now. And so from an equity perspective, I fear that this open access common situation that we've created, that's the economic jargon for this, it's going to really kill our ability to protect the space for future generations by setting aside, say, conservation easements. I think I'll pass on this one. I think you guys <laughs> so are... Everybody find Richard at the coffee break yeah. in the corner. <laughs> uh, let, let me try. Um, it's a difficult question to answer, but I don't think we can begin to answer it until we've answered the question of how much is too much. So what I mean by that 
is when we're thinking about these capacity questions, they exist on a number of levels. They exist on the, the level of the things that Richard's been studying, that Hugh talked about, how much room is in the box in terms of physical space and collision risk. Um, if you talk to the astronomers, they exist in terms of how much additional light pollution can we have without really adversely impacting you know, critical things that are done, like identifying uh, space objects before they hit Earth. Um, and they also exist from an environmental perspective. Excellent paper uh, by Marty Ross of the Aerospace Corporation just in the past 10 days talking about the environmental impacts of launches and, and satellites burning up in the atmosphere, right? And contrary to popular conception, they don't disappear. It breaks up into small particles and it hangs out in the atmosphere. And we don't really know the consequences in terms of climate change and ozone depletion. So I think we really need, as a matter of urgency, to study these issues, know what the limits are, then when we know what the limits are, we can start to address the question of how much we consume today and how much we preserve for the future. Anirit? Thank you, if I may. Um, what, what I can say is uh, everyone has to put, the, like, the, the, uh, using the space properly, it must be the priority of everyone. In that case, um, uh, again, uh, there must be like there must be a, a way of uh, like having the whole knowledge of what is happening and what is what will be happening once we we, we don't use the the, the the space responsibly. So I think the two, the there are the two things which is important. It's like uh, like the, the the proper use of space should be the priority. Again, the, there is a need of having uh, all. Uh, technically, legally, like to have the, the whole information in terms of how how we can use, how we can uh, protect, uh, like uh, in currently and in the future, how we can just to have the whole information of the best way of using space and the the, the, the impact of like misusing the the the, 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 the misusing the, the space. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we could keep going, but we, we must uh, let, let the coffee break happen. So there is coffee being served on this floor. There's also coffee and a networking space on the fourth floor, so one level down. I want to thank our coffee break sponsors for offering that opportunity. I want to thank the panel uh, for, for joining us. I want to thank the audiences for the questions. And we will be back uh, for the next session at 15 past 11 local time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.